I know that there are many issues that you would wish to raise with me. Um, so I will limit my intervention and hopefully we'll get a chance to discuss all the matters that you wish to raise, raise with me. Um, the last week has witnessed once again a full-fledged retreat um, by the government from many of its manifesto promises. And what it has left in its wake is prevarication, rumors, conjectures, and misinformation. The government does this cleverly on a, almost a weekly basis. It retreats from promises made to the Guyanese public and then misdirects them to a whole range of extraneous issues. So we saw the president saying that it's okay for ministers to call the Guyana Chronicle and speak to them about or to give instructions to the state media. Now everyone would know that this was a campaign promise of APNU AFC when they were in the opposition. They argued that the state media um, was heavily controlled by the People's Progressive Party. There was no room for opposition view and they wanted independent management of the state media. And for three years, they cut the budget of the state media largely because they said that it was not reflective of national views and that state media must not come under the control of the executive but should, given its name, state media must carry all, all the views. So having said all of that, and in the wake of the press release by the, the Press Association of Guyana, the president has now given a new position. It's okay for ministers to call the editor-in-chief and, as he said, talk about where their articles should be placed in the newspapers. Now, that's a clever distinction from content. So they can t tell them, I want my article on the front page or the last page or the middle page. But he did not address the issue of content. Are they free to direct the editor-in-chief on content? Because in the press association statement, they spoke of a minister who insists that articles about himself and the PNC must be sent to him for clearance before they are published by the state media. So this goes beyond placement of articles, it goes to the heart of the editorial independence of these bodies. So when they have to send their articles to be cleared elsewhere, then that means that the content of the Chronicle and other state media is determined elsewhere by the executive. And we had confronted this issue in the past when the Prime Minister, there was a directive from the Prime Minister's office saying that the headlines must be cleared with his office. And he subsequently denied that. Here is the President now confirming that headlines, placement of articles, and as the Press Association pointed out, even content will be determined by the executive. But the Press Association also pointed out that Imran Khan, who is the director of, or the head of the Department of Public Information, is still the chairman of the board of GNNL. 
When we were in office, the chairpersons, the last two chairpersons who chaired that board were not members of our party. Imran Khan is a leading member of the executive of AFC. So this is even more political than when the People's Progressive Party was in office because the last two chairpersons of the board were not card-bearing members of our party. When you look at the director of GINA, another card-bearing member of the executive or, um, of the AFC, the last director of GINA, at that time, he was not a card-bearing member of the party or nowhere in the executive of the party. So who is more political? It is not just political, but it smacks of AFC cronyism. The same sort of thing that they campaigned again and said that they detested. And, and there are many, many other positions because not just Imran Khan, but his wife was working with the prime minister and I can almost give you a long list of executive members of the AFC who have found jobs in ministries managed by AFC leaders. And so I disagree totally with the tone of some of the articles um, that we have seen, almost excusing the AFC and placing all the blame on APNU, where it says, oh, there must be something wrong with the executive presidency. Because can you imagine the AFC in, in a well-balanced executive with reduced powers of the president voting for the parking meter? Well, the AFC supported the parking meter. This is all they have given up on every single commitment they have made. They are no different than APNU. They are more com com for the, they, they have an Epicurean approach to, to, to life now. Seeking pleasure, pleasure seeking, comforts of office. That is the approach of the, the AFC. So when they are complicit, it's not alien to them because they can easily speak out if they were principled. Something they argue that the two main political parties were not that they were principled and multiracial. How come they can't speak out against something that is so wrong, patently wrong, the Park and Meter project, and oppose it if they were? So we're saying that they're unprincipled now. Secondly, someone said, can you imagine, I see one of the articles, can you imagine the FC supporting the, the tax on on education, the VAT on education. Well, they did. And they not only um, supported it, they sought to excuse it by misleading people. So they're very clever. In the private conversations, they say, oh, you know this man, we don't support this thing, but it's the app new boys. But if they felt that way, they should say, you have to, you, or, or if you have a principal position, take a stand, public stand, and, and if you have integrity, you'd resign, if you have integrity. But you can't benefit from both. And, and then the prime minister goes, not just that they don't agree with it, the public thinks they don't agree with it, it just happened to people. Um, PNC people, basically, but he defends this using false arguments. He sought once again to blame the sugar workers, that the sugar workers, because we have to spend a billion dollars, an additional billion dollars on sugar workers, that we now have to go and take taxes from parents who are sending their kids to private schools. And the Ministry of Agriculture 
had to intervene and correct him that it's not new money they're talking for about. It's already catered for in the budget framework. So all that he said to people there, the attempt to excuse this, this policy at the cultural center was patently false, premised on misleading people and putting the blame on sugar workers to break the solidarity that people may have with sugar workers now at this point in, in, in time. So that, but what it also revealed, and then Rupert Rupnerine said that tax records showed that these schools were not paying, paying um, their right share of taxes. So how come he knows about it? And I think he's been called out on it. You remember the one case with the Glen Lyle matter, how it became a huge issue in the whole country about how a minister of the government knew about tax matters in the GRA. And so now he said this, obviously they're, they're, they're sharing the tax record, the GRA is complicit in this too, sharing people's tax records. But as we have pointed out on several occasions, if the schools, the private schools are offending the tax laws, if they're not paying their fair share of taxes on the basis of profits they make, then by all means the GRA should go after them. But you cannot, you cannot put in place a value-added tax on the parents as a compensatory measure for the transgressions of private schools. It does not, it defies logic. So it's wrong, that argument too. And then the third thing they did not deal with is how come they're only collecting 350 about $360 million well from parents this year. They will take that from them in the, the tax on, on private education. $360 million, it's a large sum of money for parents. But the salary increases that ministers took alone, and their benefits now will be more than $360 million a year. And so they're saying that they have greater priority to the access or greater priority in terms of needs to state funds than the 20 something thousand students in, in Guyana who are going to private, who are, who are doing private education. 27 of them have greater priority to the good life than, and they're, they're doing this at the expense of these private kids. And if, if we were to just lose the case, which I'm sure we will lose on the basis, that is the state will lose on the basis of the decision that they made with regard to DDL, a decision that was made in secrecy, a secret decision. Until now, nobody knows who, who made that decision. But just the one case, Banks DIH has not filed additional cases for the subsequent year, but between 2001 and 2006 alone, they filed a case for $28 billion that will expose our treasury just on that case alone. If they can't, they got to go after parents and, and children for $360 million. How can they make a decision of that nature that could cost us $28 billion. They didn't deal with those sorts of things. They didn't deal with the huge sums we spend on travel and why we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars on fixing up state house or building huge, the wall of China now we're building in the office of the President Kampong. How much does that cost? We wouldn't know because they've not gone to tender for it. We, know, we wouldn't know. And, and what they have done, the money they have wasted, and if you add the part that's stolen on the, on the Durban Park, the Durban Park alone, that will be more than four years of what, what um, this teacher, the parents have to pay on private education. 
How come there is no commission of inquiry into that? So those were the issues. They could easily remove this without harming the revenue framework of the country. So this is something that is vital. They just mislead, as I said, but these are the same people who wanted to have free education, criticize our policy on education. First thing they did in office was to go after the students who had outstanding fees at UG, claiming that, you know, they will stop them from traveling, taking tough measures against them. Next, it's the increase in fees at the University of Guyana. Then, the VAT on private education and materials purchased for education. So we only talk about the tuition, which will affect private schools. But what about VAT on supplies for the education sector? It affects people who go to children who go to private as well as public schools. So that is their policy on free education, a full-fledged retreat from their promise. And we've seen a few writers this week talk about their full-fledged retreat also from their promises of constitutional reform. We have made it clear that we have an open mind on the issue. We are prepared to participate in a broad-based committee that involves government, opposition, civil society to examine if there are further needs to amend our constitution. We don't have a fixed idea. The consultations across Guyana should allow that, the ideas to emerge, because it's what people want that the leaders must reflect in the constitution. We said that we don't have a problem with international involvement because we need to have international experience shared with the process, but the process must be driven by Guyanese in a broad-based committee. That's our approach. Nagamutu then made a story about himself, saying we did not want to meet with him, and he's not giving up his portfolio. Now, it was not about Nagamutu, the person that we expect express reservations on. What we e express reservations about was the fact that Nagamutu is a lightweight in the government. He has no ability to even secure the o agreements they sign with APNU. If he cannot have the provisions of the Cummingsburg Accord implemented in, in, its, in a fashion that accords some power to the junior partners in the coalition, if he cannot secure an independent prime minister's office and now resides on a desk in the office of the president, that's where he is now. Uh, the, how could we believe that he can lead or any commitments he makes at any meetings that we have would be recognized by the president or APNU? And that is what we have reservations about. He is the powers. He has a no portfolio, further no portfolio. He, he deals with just the information ministry, and, and, and so that's it. So, but as, as is often the case, it's all about Nagamutu. Have you seen this? Have you seen this story? That's in the Chronicle? How he started schools, he started several schools. It's the megalomania. This is the megalomania. Just examine carefully. Before he speaks on any issue, he talks about himself for at least 30% of the time. So he did this at the cultural center, and here again, he said, I would have rebelled if I were required to pay a tax on tuition fees, which working class parents could hardly pay in the first place. So with the introduction of a value added tax on private tuition, I could relate to the sentiments being voiced against it. This is a man who says this and then comes to defend it. 
to defend it. He, he talks, I, I can't even go through it. It's, it's actually very funny. Funny. We rejected Ramastar's diabolical plot to bring oppression on the people of Linden. You know what's the oppression he's talking about? When there was an attempt to move the electricity rate from uh, where, to half of what? People paid, yes. The subvention, so electricity prices in that community will be about half of what people pay in the rest of the country. So that would have brought but the oppression to the people there. This, this is, I don't want to read it, read it if you want to, with your family and have a good laugh about it. Read it with your family. The, the next thing is I want to talk about is the Minister of Business, and particularly in light of a full-fledged, um, by one of the advisors, again, Mr. Eric Phillips, um, who said, Eman, can they get me some water, please? Who said a number of things in a letter carried today. Uh, essentially saying that he, he, he's already staked a position for himself as an advisor to this government who seems to be carrying a, a racist, an openly racist line designed to polarize our people. So, so and using false arguments and it seems as though his job is to excuse the failures of the government. This is a, a guy who said that afro guyanese fared terribly under the PPP. And we have said, let's for one moment have a fact-based analysis of afro guyanese in Guyana, because that is one of the biggest criticisms of the PPP, they're locked in between 1964 and 1992, and 1992 and 2015 when they left, we left office, and now between 2015 and now. And based on the numbers we have seen, we are prepared to engage in a fact-based analysis in terms of access to land. afro guyanese owned in that period more land than ever before. Two, in terms of vehicles and assets purchased more than in any period in our history. In terms of black-owned businesses, the greatest sport in, in Black-owned businesses came about in that period. We, we can go on. In terms of employment practices in the public service, you will see the difference. The ERC did a study there, too, that there was no institutionalized racism. And that a lot of afro guyanese like everyone else, not just afro guyanese now, are losing wealth that they have accumulated. People who did extremely well. Look at the Nigel supermarket started under the PPP. It grew to the pinnacle under the PPP as one of the major businesses in this country. It failed now. Failed. And I just gave you one. And there are hundreds of similar businesses. So we are prepared to engage in a fact-based debate. But we're not going to win with people who have a racist agenda who want to polarize the country. So let me give you a few examples. He's saying now, repeating this lie that they have had, that the economy has been sustained by, by drug money, by drug money, by gold, gold being exported illegally, etc. They keep at it. So in this Today's article, he spoke about this, and he said, this is why a 34-year-old gold miner can be arrested for fraud and for passing $17 billion through his account over a two-month period. Now listen to it. 
Sounds good. Sounds like it's supporting the argument that a lot of this, um, you know, illegal money happened or passed through the economy under the PPP. What he didn't say is if there is 17 billion that passed through this person's account, most of it took place under this government. Under this government. Because from what I gather, that this gold miner did not have a license until maybe a year or so before the government demitted office. $17 billion, most of it this year, and the fraud took place under this government. The fraud that he just caught for, and I gather a minister is closely involved in this matter. A minister is involved from this government. So this, he's talking about this as evidence of corruption of the past. It's corruption that's now, if it is corruption. I don't know if it's accurate, the 17 billion, but this took place in this period. Then he goes on to say, Omar Sharif, the permanent secretary at the Ministry of Presidency, allegedly had 18 billion passing through his account. Okay, so if that's true and it's all illegal, then you one would think that Soku by now, after two years, would have been able to lay charges on this individual. Now, this, gov this government, they fired many permanent secretaries, but they kept on Omar Sharif for a year and a half, maybe, into the new presidency. By now, two years, if someone had been so egregiously involved in money laundering, you should have been able to charge him by now. They have not charged this individual as yet. He's, he's there, I think his wife is before court for a minor in charge because, um, for not supplying some document. That is it. So it, it sounds good. It, su it supports a narrative. Tell me how many, much of the, want, the 15,000 ounces of gold per week that was smuggled out under the PPP allegedly. What is it now? Because you complain that you used to run it. What is it today? Can they tell us how much enforcement action they've taken on? Is it 10,000 ounces now? Is it 5,000 ounces? And if it is 5,000 ounces, should they not be doing better? Because they'll be collecting more taxes. It makes no sense what he's saying. But Eric Phillips is Guyana Goldfield's representative to the Private Sector Commission. Is he saying that Guyana Goldfields is engaged in gold smuggling because that he might be the authority on Guyana gold fields, but not anything else. Is he saying that they are smuggling the gold now? I don't know if he's saying that, but I saw Chronicle headline scream today, Guyana gold fields expanding scores of jobs to be created. This is the not another dream of a brighter future, like the scores of jobs that we were promised for from oil and gas that have been ephemeral you know, fleeting, disappearing, gone. So now they switched to Guyana Goldfields. But Guyana Goldfields came in under the PPP. Guyana Goldfields came under the PPP. So if it's expanding and we're creating jobs, it's a PPP investment that is leading to job creation. The same Giftland Mall started under the PPP. This mall here, PPP. The one on the East Bank, under the PPP. A lot of these projects, no no project. And this brings me to what Gaskin, Gaskin has said. And Gaskin is right, absolutely right. And I thank him for it, for being so honest. They have no investment projects to offer to anyone. They don't have anything. And he confirms it, basically. And the president, actually the president said, we don't, we're not getting investments. So. It's not 
the illegal economy of the past and drug money of the past. It's no, nobody is investing now. The, the productive sectors of the economy based on Jordan's figures have all declined. So less foreign currency, less jobs. People are laying off not because there's less drug money, but because they, the sales have collapsed. Sales have collapsed because the government is taking too much money out of the system and reducing aggregate demand. Reducing aggregate demand. We're taking more disposable income from people. So excuses by Eric Phillips will not continue to fly about, oh, it's gold money or drug money, etc. They're in office. Saru acts illegally every single day. You know the 100 tall buildings that they were talking about? Well, apparently a list has been sent to GRA. And so GRA is now becoming part of, of the apparatus to go after people. That list has been sent to GRA of the tall buildings in the city, and it's our information that soon GRA will start auditing those individuals. So Saru, a unit that is illegal, has no legal basis in the law, that is made up of political hacks who are a PPP haters now, and, and it seems as though national development haters, now they're, they're, they're directing the show about who go, the GRA will go after. How can you breed confidence in this regard? I heard somebody open a hotel, and the same day they were raided by, by, by officials of the government. So as soon as people, and you, can, and you can dig a bit more into that story, you can dig a bit more. From the time you make an investment, someone comes along. But Gaskin said, oh, we don't have a framework for public-private partnership. And, and there is a huge demand for public-private partnership. What the minister needs to know is the opportunity, how it goes about. You don't need a fixed framework for everything. If the minister is serious, you'd look at an investment opportunity where they need a public-private partnership. They will develop a prospectus. The prospectus will estimate the cost of the project. It will state the conditions under which government will participate, the conditions under which the private sector will participate. What are the benefits to private sector in being involved? Like, would they get a guarantee rate of return on their investment? Or would they get a special tax break? And then you, you advertise that. They could have done 50 of those by now if they're seriously involved in public-private partnership. It's, it's a simple thing to be done. It's not a legislative framework you need in the National Assembly. It's just ordinary work to pursue public-private partnerships. And we had started this model. That's why the Burbies Bridge was the one we started with. We developed a prospectus. We, we said we're going to offer investors a particular tax break, a return on their investment. And we advertised it for people who were interested in, in putting their money in the institution, in, in, the, in the project. You can go this route. The minister is wrong when he says that this is so. But he, he was honest enough to say that the government is looking to develop a portfolio of investment projects in the future. We're just a month away from going into the third year of this government. And they're now looking to develop a portfolio of investments. It's a bleak, bleak picture that is being painted. And what is happening in finance, bullying of the bank by finance and a compliance central bank. You, I, I would urge you to read the IDB directive. I think there was a story in the Kaichur News about it. The IDB March Caribbean Bulletin pointed out several things. It confirmed that the exchange rate had depreciated contrary to what the Ministry of Finance is saying. Secondly, 
it said that confirm what we have always been saying from the GMA dinner and all the press conferences that foreign direct investment is down, remittances are down, all the major sect sectors except in gold is up, um, down, all of them, the fl flow, flow of capital to the con or foreign currency to the country. It confirmed that. And so, but what it said, that there was a cabinet approved directive. Now note these words, cabinet approved directive to send, that was sent by the central bank to the cambios to limit their spread to $3. Now, that is illegal, first of all, under the Dealers in Foreign Currency Act, but it tells you who is now intervening in the foreign currency market. It's no market forces anymore. It's this inept cabinet that we have that is now doing that. Cabinet, cabinet approved directive. The words were carefully selected by the Inter-American Development Bank. But further to that, the exporters were calling, some of them, and, and they were told, you will be de-risked. We'd lose your account if you don't sell your money at 250. So that is confiscation of property now. They're telling you money that you own, you have to sell it at a particular rate that the government wants. And when in the mar out there, in the real market, where the market is clearing, people are getting 228. 228. And so that is the first, first point. Then they told the bankers not to buy for more than 250, or else they're going to start taking money out of the banking system. And by the way, I heard 3 billion was transferred out of the housing fund. Into where? I don't know, but maybe you can check it. 3 billion left the housing fund. And so this is why the rate is being propped artificially. It's not the real market, and at some point in time, it will depreciate. The, I, as I said before, I'm not going to go on for very long. I just wanted, I saw um, Gulseran is writing in the Starbuck News, and I want to ask the editors of the Starbuck News to, to just um, maybe ask him, because we have been unable to get him to disaggregate the $28 billion that he claimed was stolen. There's 15 to 20% procurement fraud that took place under the PPP. He keeps repeating it up to a, to a few days ago. He repeated that. Now, you, a serious columnist would disaggregate in the face of calls by everyone. He would be, especially a former Auditor General, will want to prove his case and prove us wrong. Secondly, I saw a two-part article on the Integrity Commission. And he said that in 2006, the chairman resigned. You know, prior to that, Mr. Corbyn had gone to the court. But what he did not see is that, because it created the impression that the Integrity Commission was not functioning from 2006. Now, the chairman of the Integrity Commission may not have been in place, but the statutory requirement to file returns did not disappear because you had a secretariat, a functioning secretariat. So every year, the secretary to the commission would send a notice to all the people who had to submit their returns, and we had to submit our returns. So the commission was functional. There was, you can't move away. It did not stop because the chairman resigned. The requirement under the law to file the returns should have made that point, a very critical point, because many APRU people never complied. So it created the impression it's not that it was non-functional since then. What APNU has recently done is to disband the secretariat, the people, the staff, 
so no longer can they send out the notices or collect the returns of the members of parliament. A huge distinction. But he just reported on the act without pointing these things out. And then I'm surprised that he would say that these, the 10 points, are to strengthen the act. And he did not deal with the point about its enforcement, the point I made about how is it that the president now and the minister of state will have powers of sanction over members of parliament for any future breach of the integrity commission. Did not deal with that. And, and so these articles are sterile. So whoever is from the Starbrook News, I hope they can put these questions to him so that in future that we will we'll get some answers um, to, to what we've been saying for a very long time. Um, I'd end here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we, we start with Kaichur. Two from Kaichur at the beginning, and then I switch to the others, then we come back. Right. All right, so nobody walks out this time. Right. You know that, right? <laughs> uh, here. We still there. Um, You said that there's no need for a fixed framework for everything. So during the PPP's uh, time, you guys developed your own guidelines for how these PPP's would be yeah. Yeah. carried out. You What's the question? Own, you developed your own. I wanted to confirm that you developed your own guidelines. Uh, yes. Let me say that each, once you seek out actively a public-private partnership. The first thing is that the government can, will determine the need for financing. Mm -hmm. So for example, if it decides that a large infrastructure project, for one reason or another, should not, um, should be done, it doesn't have the resources to do this. It, it, so the decision is made, we will seek private capital in partnership with the government. Mm -hmm. Then the government will develop the guidelines surrounding that project. You can't develop a guideline for a bridge project, a, a one framework. You can do it generally, but it doesn't make sense. That will look at hydro, that will be the same as a bridge or a public road, a toll road, or say an airport that is done where the investors receive tolls, etc. Each project, different in nature, would require different guidelines. That's what I'm saying. So that is why the best way is the prospectus is developed, like a private company that goes into the capital market. The government does the same. It develops the pro prospectus. It advertises, and the prospectus is sent to all the people who have expressed interest. And then they submit their interest on the basis of the prospectus. It's then evaluated. And then you make the decision about who to go with in this regard. So we did not explore, we had just started exploring public-private partnerships. Because most of our, our projects were funded either from rev um, revenue, grants, or soft loans. So there was no need to, to explore private investment in many cases. And the Burbies Bridge too, we, because at that time we were in an IMF program and we had access to $11 million um, that was put in an IDB loan to do the approaches to the bridge. Um, there was the IMF did not want it to be a fully government owned project. So we found a, a, a clever way of getting the project done and still, still um, well, the project done by the inclusion of the private sector, but it was done openly. If you check that period, although we have this thing about Ram Roop invested and different people invested, check the advertisements that went out. We advertise for investors. People, because there was a guaranteed rate of return, 
we, it, we thought it would be good for institutional investors to put their money in that would benefit their depositors or people who had their money. So if, you, if you're looking for a fixed framework that will cover all sorts of projects, all sorts of projects from a, a wind power project to a solar project to a bridge to a road, whatever, you're going to wait forever. When you can do it and still ensure transparency by developing, using a private sector method, that is the development of a prospectus. And so that I would urge Gaskin to focus on. Please. I heard that minister has been making lots of calls to people. I, that's what the media is there for. I, I gave you a, a trail. You have to sniff it out now. I hope that uh, Soku will have the minister in since they're investigating connections. Since they're investigating connections. That. So. That, that's all now. Um, other media houses. Seems as though Kaitur oh, alone. Brand yeah. Brand oh, oh, your brand, brand news? news. points that we've been making, I think, would be adequately captured in, I read an editorial this morning from the, the Starbuck News, and I think that, that captures the points we've been making. Um, uh, still, it, it says, you know, this is behavior reminiscing of past government. I was hoping they didn't mean us, but a a past pre-PPP government because we never sent no state agency of that name, created a SARU, which was illegal first of, the all, first of all, a SARU in the office of the President Kampong, um, with political hacks hired to this. People who have no skills, if you look at the skill list too, you know, no skill in the area, operating illegally to raid people's homes, to direct the GRA and to do these illegal acts. We, there is nothing surreptitious about this, the NDC action. They, this was part of their minutes. You know, they went to the minutes and they got one of their counselors to share the minutes of the meeting and then took action on the basis of the minutes. Don't they have anything else to do? But if you think these are excesses, you just wait until the law is passed, then no Guyanese is safe. We will we'll come after us in the political end. We, we have a, a voice and we can exp expose them. There are hundreds and thousands of Guyanese who don't have voices or are intimidated, afraid, that will be harassed for ver and, and, and discriminated against. And many of them are being shaken down by people. Saru officials are collecting money. I, I, I know they don't have any means of tracking their assets, how it has grown in some cases. How are we going to track the assets of Saru individuals who went in there, some in case, close to penury, and now are or very from all of our reports are pretty are pretty um, their accounts are pretty well stacked. Let me be very careful about that. But but no, there is corruption in Saru. There is corruption in Saru. I'm not I'm not careful on that. Corruption, shaking down of businessmen, taking money from people. Corruption there. Yeah. Yes.
Are you saying that if he's removed from that position, he will challenge the reform process that he will be put by the No. Um, on that one, on that one, I said it was so disrespectful, and the the draft was so terrible because the mere fact that they wanted to give a minister of state authority to remove an elected member of parliament didn't require a response from us. They needed to go back to the drafting table, like the Sarah bill too. The, the Sarah bill. They, they, that they need to go back to the drafting table on that bill. You know, going to a select committee, it's, it's so unconstitutional in many regards that it's going to be challenged from day one. So that's what I said in relation to that one, the Integrity Commission Act. In this case, we are saying we want to be given assurances from the president not from Nagamutu, because as I said before, he's a lightweight. He's a messenger boy. They sent him to, they sent him to Rose Hall to announce the closure of the Rose Hall estate long before Harmon said, we're taking the white paper to parliament to discuss. And he went to Rose Hall. He's the messenger. So why would you send a Nagamutu who don't, uh, to go and defend the... Um, the fat on private education. You would send Jordan, at least Jordan would make some sense. Oh, yeah. Jordan would make some sense. You'd send the Nagamutu. So we are saying the president needs to give a commitment that whatever comes out of this body will be seriously considered. Not that we get the impression that have sent, sent it to Nagamutu for it to die a healthy death. Because, and that is why he, uh, the whole issue of constitutional reform, anything that doesn't have high priority in government mm -hmm. or when they need to make an excuse, they funnel to him. And so as a serious party, we don't want to be, caught wasting, be wasting our time. If the president gives a commitment that we'll establish this broad-based body involving all the par par the parliamentary opposition and government and civil society like we did it the last time, then why shouldn't we just be prepared to participate and listen to people, have hearings, etc.? Why would we not want to do that? No, remember I, I sought meetings on various issues, but um, this one here, this is it did not come up. The president invited me for a specific purpose. That meeting I managed to get on the agenda, the whole issue of the non-compliance with the advice of the JSC. And I pointed out to the president that he does not have discretion the Constitution was changed to say the President shall act in accordance with the advice of the GSC. He said to me, he's dealing with the matter. Um, we're still waiting to see how the matter would be dealt with. The Court of Appeal doesn't have any judges. They don't have a, a single Court of Appeal judge in the country now. And it, this doesn't seem to be given any or, or be treated with any sense of urgency. So that matter, this one we, we did not talk about. Sir, yes, please. Um, no, I've not read the report. Let me say that right at the beginning. But the PUP always has an open mind to anything that will ensure fair action and transparency at GCOM. The only thing that we want out of GCOM 
is to have a machinery that is impartial, independent, and that will conduct free and fair elections. And so we have an open mind to that system, to whatever, how that evolves in the future. But that would require constitutional change. And you know, in this climate, we, it seems very difficult to predict that we'll have those any time before the next elections. So right now, we have a formula in our constitution that governs the machinery, the leadership of GCOM, and how it conducts itself. And it is that formula that we are trying to ensure is applied in a manner that is consistent with our constitution. Hence the, the list and the work now on submitting some additional names to, to the president. So it, it is quite interesting how Mr. Serge Bali has now become like a bulb, a 200 watt bulb. I know all these ideas about reform and everything else, but he didn't pursue any of those things. Even, even suggested at one stage that uh, a judge uh, or the first category, either a judge, a former judge, or someone eligible to be a judge should hold the position. Yet he was none of, none of the three. Um, at this stage, it's the only formula that we have. That's precisely what we are saying. If in the future that is changed, then we will participate in discussions on the change, provided that they can assure in a highly politicized environment like ours, they can assure us the same things that I've stated, the three goals of an independent, impartial, um, fair elections machinery in the country. And on the AG matter? Oh, on the, on the AG matter, um, I hope it's not concluded. It's just that it's been knocked out a little bit from the new cycle. But I would expect that the president will treat this matter seriously. And if he sweeps it under the carpet, it is one more very telling trait of the president, one of the more telling traits, or one of the traits of the president that exposes his real nature about how he deals with matters when they're concerned with people or when, when they concern people in his inner circle. So the drug bond, a cover-up committee, and it's still too much money being spent there. In fact, the drug bond, if they cancel it, that's half of their money right away for the school fees, a corrupt act, for the, for the VAT on private education. Half of it can come from just that. Don't need to pursue it. But look how we dealt with that one. Look how Durban Park was dealt with, swept under the carpet. On this issue, again, the Volder Lawrence matter, 605 million in procurement, um, single source procurement. All of these issues, because people say, oh, the president is a, a, aloof and you know, he, he doesn't deal, concern himself, himself with these matters. But when he does, he doesn't do these things with a view of <coughs> bringing them to the resolution, to, to their uh, conclusion, or establish an independent process that will <coughs> guide him. He just covers them up. And so at some stage, he has to start taking the blame. And then <coughs> this whole issue with the the COI that was established. Now we have made it clear that we must not use this issue to polarize our people. <coughs> we supported Ghana 
CARICOM called for reparation when I was president. But reparation dealt with both afro guyanese and indo guyanese We're not attempting to compare the harshness of slavery versus indentureship because it, there is no comparison. Indentureship was hard, but slavery was atrocious, atrocious, um, horrendous. Was, we made it clear it was a holocaust. And so never attempted to do that. So I thought that they would continue to pursue that approach. And you've had ACTA calling for a look at uh, black ancestral lands for a long time. So the government is free to pursue looking at that issue <coughs> if it wants to. But it cannot do so by taking a position particularly as expressed by Vincent Alexander, who is an advisor to their government. He's been a senior official of the PNC, and he is the representative at GCOM, saying words that the Amerindian <coughs> land issue cannot be resolved out of the context of land resolution of land issues for other groups in Guyana. This is running counter to our history and the commitment made to Amerindian people that everyone recognized from Burnham, from the colonial days to Burnham, <coughs> entire PNC period. The PBP, when it got into office, started giving effect by titling. <coughs> when we got into office, 6.2% of Guyana was title land. It was over 14% by the time we left. We left a land titling project, billions of dollars in it, put in from the Norway project to keep our commitment to indigenous people. We passed an Amerindian act that is now law in this country that enshrines a process through which you can deal with indigenous or Amerindian lands in Guyana. So the president establishing a commission to deal with both issues together seems to reflect a thinking that was betrayed or made public by Alexander. And if that is so, it will create major problems in this country and polarize our country along racial lines once again. But if that seems to be the objective of the government, then this, this might be a way of doing it. So the president then says, we consulted, but with whom? The National Tushaus Council, which is the elected body, said, you didn't consult with us on the terms of reference nor the establishment of the commission. And the four Amerindian NGOs that we have in Guyana have all issued a statement that they were not party to it. So with whom? So clearly, he has misrepresented that issue, misrepresented the issue of consultations. And then there, even after the Tushaus Council issued a statement calling for this commission to be disbanded, then he still proceeded with the appointment of the last member. I think this is a divisive issue designed to polarize our people. We don't have a problem with establishing another commission to deal with black ancestral lands. The government can do that too. But to, to put both of these things in the same commission without consulting with the, the indigenous people's organizations or the Amerindian organizations and the NTC is not only disrespectful, but it runs counter to our commitments to the people to the Amerindian people and to the laws. And that's why we're taking a position. And they're in the business of selling false hopes. So scores of jobs at Goldfield, scores of jobs from oil. You know, how will the Amerindian, the, the black ancestral lands issue create jobs for young people from South Georgetown? A commission of inquiry they would spend tons of millions of dollars on, tens of millions. And I think it's, 
It's becoming a racket. They have so many commissions, these commissions, and then the people get huge sums of money. It seems like a payoff of people. And you, it would be interesting to track each of the commissions they put in place and how much money people got from the commission. But how would the resolution or report on that deal with the youngster that can't find the, the two young persons from La Penitence who came to Freedom House and said they're working at a uh, teleperformance um, of investment that came in under the PVP, and they only could because it's seasonal work. And so they don't have a full-time job, and they can't now even pay their rent they were going to go on the street month end. How does it help to solve that? We are not perfect. We didn't create jobs or anyone. But this government promised it tens of thousands of jobs more. But people are losing what we have created now. How would this establishment of this commission, or if you do establishment on ancestral lands, deal with a young kid from South Georgetown who is looking for a job now? They're not going to get lands. And, and, you know, based on this report, they, they, so it sells a false impression. It keeps all of these ethnic issues in the boil so that people will, you know, once again, you know, think maybe I don't have, I, I, I don't have to look at my economic reality because this government defends the race. And that is a thinking that we must destroy in this country polarizing our people as the economy fails, pushing, and we see it every day in all of the articles. It seems as though this is their strategy. Our language, as I said before, is bringing people together, working for national issues. All of the people of this country have equal access to the resources and must benefit together. That's our approach. Sir, so, mm -hmm. yes, go ahead. started to come out, sir, that the foreign currency situation was something created by the Ontario Party to destabilize the government. How would you react? And that's a new one now, yeah. <laughs> well, well, that's a new one. This is the first time I've heard this, actually. They, because it flies in the face. So we told the IDB to write that report, too. Did we say to the Inter-American Development Bank, which is a Washington-based organization, that they should write that foreign direct remittances are done, foreign remittances are done, the foreign direct investment is done, that gold proceeds are done, and not gold, rice, bauxite, sugar, forestry proceeds are done. We guess where you can find those figures? In the ID, but Jordan's budget. Look at the balance of payment numbers in Jordan's budget. So they want to create this impression. If all of them, the supply to the market is done and the demand is still there, then you, the de you're going to have a depreciation of the currency. And now, with all of the thing about going into people's bank account, taking their taxes, blocking them at the airport when they, if they owe taxes. The Saru wanting to raid people with tall building. People, and then the fear of depreciation. People might want to hold more foreign currency too. So they might buy and they don't want to sell to the market. How could that happen? And uh, so ignoring all of that, then the IMF itself said, greater exchange rate flexibility. The IMF didn't say the PPP, and they, they said this is because, and they gave a reason, they gave a reason. And so, there's similar reasons. 
this is the reality of the situation. But like with everything else, this government blames the PPP for, 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 for everything. Like with everything else, um, they blame the PPP for everything. The only reason. So if they believe <coughs> that's the truth time because of, of what these, these people, the cabinet is, is doing. Th thank you. Oh, you, you want to fight here about me not allowing them one day and, and walked out, although I had allowed three questions already to come from Kai. So actually five. Anyhow, I don't want that to happen again now. Yeah, sure. One, one, yes. Which one? Get the worst one. Get the worst one. Your uh, black man is telling you which one. Go ahead. GMA, what is GMA? That's why that's a failure too, you know? Oh God, now you told me why I can't move forward. All right, yeah, now I understand, yeah. yeah. Well, he wrote us saying, asking us for a nominee on the board. And since Bibi Shadik was heading the board, we decided, well, she should go back as member of the board for continuity. She could explain things and stuff. So after writing us and we sent the name to him, he said he has to seek clearance from Harmon <laughs> Nagamotu. <laughs> now, that's what I'm talking about. You know, it's provided for. They announce it. It's probably gazetted. He wrote us saying, can you submit a name for me to appoint? And now can't go ahead with it because he still needs to go and sit outside of Harmon's office and wait on him to get it approved. Thank you. Thank you.